welcome back to the Crossover Podcast. My name is David Shinehawk. I'm here to entertain you for a little bit. We're talking all things sports and esports and the Big Apple and beyond. So the topic that has clearly dominated my social media this weekend, which provided a very easy podcast topic, was skill-based matchmaking. So for those out of the loop or on Xbox or PC but do not have a PlayStation, Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, which, horrible name by the way, wish they would just call it Call of Duty Cold War, had its pre-release alpha. There will be a beta later in October, but this was just five maps, go in, have fun, no ranking up, no unlocks, nothing significant. It was just supposed to be a good, fun weekend of Call of Duty gameplay. I played five games or so so far. I'm probably actually going to hop on for a little bit longer later and play after I get done grinding some League play and League of Legends. But the game is a blast. It's the most Call of Duty, Call of Duty, if that makes sense. It's the most 20, 20, well, 2019 to 2015 feeling Call of Duty that I've played in a while. Like, the last few games have just been, for lack of a better term, bad. And a lot of people are complaining this weekend because there's some really fine-tuned skill-based matchmaking in the game. Where good players are playing against only good people. They don't get to see any bad kids in the lobby. Therefore, they feel like it's a sweat fest, you have to try your ass off every single game, and it's just ruining the game. And the takes have been kind of all over the place. You have some people who actually prefer it. Obviously, the developers want skill-based matchmaking in the game, which we'll get into the specifics in a little bit. You have the esports pros, like Scump, and a lot of the people that I follow from NRG, like Hitch, who really are against it for clear reasons they're trying to make content where they can pop off in pubs but they aren't able to because everybody's trying their ass off in the game so i want to start with the root of skill-based matchmaking why it exists and the reality is not all players are good at the game and we all know that you need some sort of system to allow newer players to come in to experience just a tiny taste of what it's like to play again, or well, what it's like to pop off in a game, more or less. And there's only one way to do that, and that's to filter out good people. So these are what, in Call of Duty, has been coined as Christmas noobs, people that get the game on Christmas from their parents, generally speaking, anywhere from the age of like 11 to 15, who suck at the game, who are still learning. You can just go into a lobby and you can absolutely destroy. You'll see clips on Twitter of people going 72 and 0, of just absolutely insane statistics that realistically are just not normal. These people want to go in And they want to play the game and they want to have fun just as much as the people at the top do. And the current opinion, at least the general sense consensus that I've seen on Twitter, is that skill-based matchmaking is a bad thing and should go away. Because these people should not be protected. They should be thrown into the ringer like most of us were back in 2007 whenever we started with COD 4 or Modern Warfare 2 when pub stomping lobbies were probably at their peak. But I truly do believe that skill-based matchmaking should exist. I don't think there's a way to massively grow a game without having a way to introduce casual players to the game without them absolutely hating it in the first 20 minutes. So I'll compare this to a game like League of Legends, which I play all the time. You, You can't even play against casual people that are not bots until after you understand the game a little bit. I forget the leveling system, but you have to hit a certain level, I think it's like 5 or something like that, before you can hop in and play non-bot opponents. So, 
Does that mean by level 5 that you have a fair understanding of the game? Absolutely not. You're still trash all the way up until the time that you're level 30. But the reality is you get this little weaning period before you actually get into the game itself. Whenever you get into the game itself, you are still playing against fairly new people. You are not playing against anybody that is of a much higher skill level. There's no noob stomping before the before you hit level 30. It just doesn't happen all that often. You'll have occasionally like a smurf or two who's creating a count, but it's not it's not as common as people think it is. So what happens then? What happens after you hit level 30? You hit that casual point and you start getting better. Well, you go play rank play. If you're not playing rank play, you can play casually still, but realistically, a lot of people will make the swap to competitive in some at some point in time just because you want a skill check. You when you get competent to the point where you can hold your own in a normal lobby, everybody enjoys a challenge. And that's exactly what rank play provides. Now, when you're playing a normal game, when you're at level 30 or higher, you're still not playing against bad people. The reality is you have an elo, even in a casual lobby, that you will still get put into a match. Be- or, well, you will find a match with people of similar skill set, although the range will vary a lot more than ranked, where it's very strict that you have to be within a certain parameter to find a lobby with each other. Now, what happens with this? So, if say you are a say you are a competitive person who is playing a a casual game on Summoner's Rift in League of Legends, well, the skill discrepancy is not so big to the point where you can play champions that you've never played and absolutely pop off. Like it's just not going to happen. The reality is these people have a borderline understanding of how the game works and can punish you. If you play a new champ, so say I'm an ADC and a new champion comes out and I want to learn how to play her, I'm decently proficient at the role that I'm in, I should be able to go in and have a decent time so long as I understand the mechanics of the champion. Say I want to go in and play top lane or a lane that I've never played before and have no mechanics or understanding of, I'm going to get smashed because these people have a general understanding of the lanes and of the roles that they play. Now turn this over to Call of Duty. There is no system to protect newer players from even each other within the first few games. You get online and you just play. Now granted, it's still going to be against level 1 opponents. So it's fairly new people, but the reality is you're at the time whenever all these people are playing, you're probably going to get somebody who's fairly skilled. And skill-based matchmaking will tune that very quick. But as you hit, say, level 10 or 15 in Call of Duty, what happens then? Oh, there's there's no weaning into it. You're automatically in that same pool of people that you have when you hit level 30 in League of Legends. There's no discrepancy at all. What happens when you push that even further and say you prestige once, then what? You've realistically maxed out your rank to the point where you are not going to be doing anything new or unique in a public game other than trying out new weapons and new items. So where would the competitive person go? Well, the game's not set up like that. There's no flushed out rank play system that actually benefits somebody who wants to play at a competitive level so all of those people get stuck in public matches and rather than addressing the main issue of establishing some sort of rank play the developers simply just let it happen and they tune skill-based matchmaking so that these tryhards or the people who have reached a certain skill level that realistically should be playing ranked or should be playing competitive they don't necessarily have any first person or first party option to go to and that sucks so i think i agree with the majority of the community where if you put in a decent rank play system 
that allows people of a competitive nature to go in and play at a competitive level consistently, I think you'll reduce some of the pressure on the public lobby system and reduce the amount of skill-based matchmaking tuning that you need to have. So there still needs to be some. The reality is you shouldn't be able to go into a public lobby of Call of Duty with the worst weapon and be able to perform at the same level as when you're playing with the best weapon. You should be punished for using a weaker weapon. It should be more difficult on you because everybody else, or at least the majority of them in the lobby, should be using something that's more meta. Does that line up with what everybody currently expects in the community? I don't think so. I think skill-based matchmaking needs to be a thing. So I had this interaction on Twitter last night where I established that I feel like a lot of people think that skill-based matchmaking is a floor. Where, you know, say, using Peloton's rate of perceived exertion. So rate of perceived exertion is the amount of output that you feel like you're giving on a scale of 1 to 10. If your rate of perceived exertion in a public lobby is a 4, where it's more casual, and your rate of perceived exertion in a rank play game is a 7, not the most competitive, but fairly, if you give a 2 in terms of effort in the public lobby, you realistically should be punished because most other people should be playing at a 4. Even if somebody else's 4 is equivalent to your 2, ultimately, you should still be punished for that. Or at least, they should be able to take advantage of it to a small extent. So, in the current example with Call of Duty Cold War, say the skill-based matchmaking parameters are that you're on your scale, you will not be paired up with anybody that's outside of the rate of perceived exertion of a 3 to 5. Is that fair? Probably not at the moment, but if you adjust that and say you go from a 2 to a 6, so you'll have some people that are better than you, and you'll have some people that are worse than you, I think for the majority of the competitive community, that'll be fine. Now what happens to the pros at the top who are trying to make content? They're at a 10. Their 4 is a 10 to everybody else. They're impossible to balance. The reality is you kind of have to ignore them. You have to cater for everybody else, specifically the semi-competitive people, and then the casual people. That's the two main groups that you need to balance here. So I don't. I think you kind of have to ignore the pros relative skill set when trying to balance this. But there's more issues here. So we established the relative range of which it should work, and then reality should say that you should move into competitive, but Call of Duty doesn't have that, so they should develop it. Well, there's more to it. I think the majority of the problem, specifically in Call of Duty with skill-based matchmaking, is the fact that North America is not a competitive region in general, at least in Call of Duty. You look at Reddit specifically, which is not a true indicator of the entire community, but it definitely does give you an indication of where public perception and opinion is at the moment. The reality is, the casual subreddits for Call of Duty absolutely hate competitive. You go on the regular Call of Duty subreddit and it is very clear that they believe that competitive gaming and competitive Call of Duty ruins the balance and the fun of everything else. Do I agree with them? Absolutely not. I think a good competitive game can also be good casually, but a good casual game does not always make a good competitive game. And the reality is, Activision is investing a lot of money. They should make a good competitive game that is also good for casual and will still sell millions of copies a year. Now, what is this going to lead to within the general community perception? So here's the problem. If people are predominantly casual, adding a ranked playlist doesn't necessarily change anything with the culture. You can get some people to play ranked, you can get it to develop over time and it will slowly get better, but you're not going to see that long-term fix happen in two to three years. That's going to take a long time. In reference to the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, may she rest in peace, there was a quote in On the Basis of Sex, which I believe she used, where it said, it was the, it, well, it was specifically the scene where her daughter was hailing a taxi. 
vehicle, her and her daughter were hailing a taxi, and guys were catcalling them. The daughter said to the mom, you can't just wait for culture to change. You have to change it yourself. And the view from Ruth Bader Ginsburg's point of view is that until the culture changes around a subject, you can't enact laws to change it. Until the culture of Call of Duty and North American gaming in general progresses to the point where competitive is okay, which is a really bizarre statement to say, I don't think even the ranked playlist is going to change all that much. It might loosen some parameters, but the reality is the majority of Call of Duty fans just don't like competitive for some reason. I know League of Legends doesn't necessarily represent all of North American gaming values because the reality is console sales dominate PC sales in terms of gaming. Although in terms of esports, viewership is much higher on PC games. That's not where the money lies. The money lies in Call of Duty. It's the best selling game in the world, or not more specifically to isolate this scenario. It's the best selling game in North America, and that's not changing for an extended period of time. League of Legends has its own issues with rank play, with people smurfing once they hit a certain skill cap and going under. It's it's clearly evident that rank play does not sh solve everything. There's only so much you can do until culture around you changes, until people around you change. Look, there's a reason why China dominates League of Legends. It's because everybody actually buys into the rank play system. Yes, there are problems in North America like 60 ping and other different factors I that's a whole topic for a separate podcast, but the general community perception in rank play in North America is rather lazy for the most part. Compare that to the countries that actually succeed in esports, and it's very competitive. Now, how does that compare to Call of Duty? It's we don't even have a rank play system, so it's kind of hard to judge. But the reality is, I still feel like even if you get a rank play system, it's going to be more of the same. People just don't care. They really don't. It's sad. I wish they cared, and I think console gaming is the spot where, if it's going to succeed, this will be the one that does. Even though Call of Duty has less viewership than League of Legends, Counter-Strike, and most other PC games, it has the highest potential to grow if the casual community would actually embrace it. There's one other issue, though, which I think is the biggest issue with console gaming, and it's that you can't invest long-term into a game like you can on PC. I bought skins in League of Legends four years ago that I can still use today. My rank and all the time that I put into League of Legends four years ago still means something today. In Call of Duty, you can establish your baseline understanding of the game, that's fine, but nothing you did in Black Ops 3 means anything in this game. None of the experience. None of the weapon, the weapon leveling, none of the rank play, none of it means anything. You need to fix the sustainability issue with console gaming. Call of Duty games need to have something that rolls over from game to game that makes it worth investing your time and energy into that's not just going to go away. That will start to fix culture. Because people actually feel like it's something that they can invest a lot of energy into. That means a lot. For the dad that comes home and only has two hours of time to play, those two hours mean a lot more than somebody who has eight hours to play on a Saturday. Now granted, they may spend them in different ways. The dad might not want to play competitively, but what if he does? That two hours is a hell of a lot different than your 16, 17-year-old who's can. You know, he's just going to have two hours tomorrow, too. Screw it. Give people something that they can invest their time into. It's the reason why when you look at regular sports, you look at the Steelers, for example, because my family's big on the Pittsburgh Steelers. My dad can invest his time and his money into season tickets for the Steelers. Why? Because he knows that it's going to be something that will still exist five to ten years from now. I can promise you my dad would not invest anything like that into gaming or esports because he still thinks that it's a fad he still thinks that it's going to go away and that definitely affects the perception that comes out of this so in conclusion to wrap all this up because i know it's been 20 minutes and a lot of different points have been said skill-based matchmaking is a thing that is needed but there are so many other things that you can do around it that can help alleviate the pressure that's on skill-based matchmaking. You need a decent rank play system. You need 
to change the culture around North American video games in general. You need to add continuity and you just need to give people a reason to accept that it's okay to grind competitive, but also okay to chill and relax. Thank you guys for tuning in for another episode. I really do appreciate all the love and support. Please drop a follow whether you're listening on Spotify, whether you're listening on Apple. I appreciate all the love and support. If you have any topics that you'd like me to discuss, please feel free to hit me up on Twitter. My handle is at dshinok, D-S-Z-A-J-N-U-K. All feedback is welcome. I have a few topics coming up that I'm excited about. One is actually uh, second and third quarter social media analytics. You'd be surprised which org is dominating. And the other, I want to start finally getting in depth into New York City's esports scene. There's a lot to unpack here. A lot of mystery, a lot of problems, but a lot of potential. A lot, a lot of untapped potential. We'll see where it goes. Thank you guys for tuning in. Catch you on the next episode. Bye.